Hello everyone and welcome back uh, to our conference. Uh, we're now day two, session three, and I'm very pleased uh, to chair that uh, session, which is devoted to the question of social movements and democracy, with the subtitle of Past, Present and Future. The purpose of today's panel is to try and broaden our discussion of democracy beyond the level of state design and to think through the role and contribution of political campaigns and social movements in forging and in remaking democracy. Uh, thinking about the contribution of social movements to the broader polity, but also thinking about the ways in which social movement campaigns uh, enact uh, particular forms of decision making and association. The purpose of uh, or the design of today's session is also deliberately historical and comparative. We're asking uh, experts in various social movements to think back to the history of those movements, um, and we're also asking them to compare movements. We're very pleased to, um, that, that five uh, eminent experts in social movements have agreed uh, to join with us today, um, and uh, I'll introduce them as they come up to speak. Um, the structure of today's uh, panel is also slightly unorthodox, so what I'm asking uh, each of our experts to do is, first off, I'm giving them 10 minutes, and in that 10 minutes I'm asking them to think through, first of all, how a given social movement has shaped Australian democracy. And Once each of them have done that, I'm then going to invite them back uh, for a further five minutes in which they're going to reflect on the relationship between social movements. Uh, and also to explicitly address the question of the future of democracy and the role of social movements in that future. So that's a, a really challenging task and I'm especially uh, grateful that you've all uh, taken on that challenge. So as I said, we have uh, five um, really fantastic uh, speakers and I'll introduce them in turn. But the first person uh, to speak this afternoon is Professor Verity Bergman. Uh, Verity, uh, of course, is an expert on many social movements, has written uh, several books uh, ranging across histories of the labour movement, histories of uh, new social movements and mobilisations, histories of the environmental and climate change movements. Uh, she's uh, been very active here at the University of Melbourne as an academic for many years, and she continues, uh, of course, also to act as a director of the Reason and Revolt uh, online website. Uh, which is a repository of documents to do with radical movements and social movements in Australian history. So I'm delighted that Verity uh, can participate this afternoon, and she's going uh, to talk to us about the environmental movement and democracy. Okay, thanks, Sean, and I acknowledge that I'm speaking from the lands of the Wurundjeri people and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. The environmental movement has redefined the polity in many ways, firstly and obviously by asserting the rights and interests of future voters. It argues for intergenerational equity, that the present generation should leave future generations with an environment as healthy as it experiences, that we should not borrow environmental capital from future generations just because they don't vote, as the Brundtland Report noted in 1987. Now, climate change has highlighted this need for intergenerational equity, and extreme weather events are now shortening its time frame, bringing the climate change problem from the future to the present. So, for example, we saw Greens picking up three seats in much-flooded Brisbane at the last federal election. And naturally, environmentalists have been at the forefront of moves to reduce the voting age to 16. Younger voters care more about the planet. But mere reduction of the voting age is not enough. Environmentalism's redefinition of the polity embraces the unborn. It also redefines the polity in its articulation of the interests of non-human animals and nature itself in the form of trees, rivers, oceans and so on. It argues either that non-human animals and ecosystems should be protected because human life depends on their health and well-being that the economic system must not destroy the external conditions and upon which it depends for its continuation, or that the value of non-human animals and ecosystems is intrinsic. It does not depend on their value to humans. They have inherent worth. Uh, living bodies and objects such as rivers and mountains are not placed there for the convenience of humans who do not have the right to plunder and endanger them. 
These redefinitions of the polity promote ideas of stewardship and humility towards our planet. So environmentalism raises new political questions. Firstly, simply to have or to be, as Eric Fromm put it in 1979. The alternative COP movement has pointed to a structural problem of two forms of life, one of overconsumption, waste, luxury, individualism, capitalism. The other, living well, food enough for all, living in harmony with others and Mother Earth in solidarity and complementarity. Because the environmental movement is concerned with the most basic of human needs, survival, and we know that current consumption patterns are unsustainable, it necessarily poses this question to have or to be, and it criticises the consumption patterns of those who consume most in the developed rather than the underdeveloped world, the rich more than the poor, and mostly men more than women. Another related new question raised is that of climate justice, the problem of the inverse correlation between culpability and suffering. We know that countries with extremely low emissions will be amongst the worst affected by climate change. Australia is just one of the few countries uh, that is both culpable and vulnerable. Now, we know that COP27 recently accepted that countries which caused the problem in the first place should contribute to adaptation costs for poorer, vulnerable countries. But also within countries, there is and will be an inverse correlation between culpability and suffering. So environmentalists have emphasised that wealthier individuals create more and poorer people create fewer emissions. But the problem is, is that the wealthier will be able to buy their way out of unsafe or simply unpleasant environments, whereas poorer people everywhere will have fewer options, yet they have contributed least to global warming. So that's the primary injustice of climate change. But there's also the secondary injustice of climate change that mitigation efforts also disproportionately adversely affect poorer people or workers, whether they're in, um, workers in fossil fuels or poor, poorer households um, coping with higher energy prices as a result of market-based so-called solutions such as emissions trading schemes. Now, environmentalism has experimented with new practices too, and I've thought of at least seven. Um, firstly, it's linked up with workers' power, notably in the Green Bands movement of the early 1970s when builders' labourers refused to work on projects that threatened environment and heritage. And in this movement, environmentalists and resident activists at last found that they were able to contest developers' and politicians' decision-making processes. For example, the battlers for Kelly's Bush had tried all the usual methods available in a liberal democracy, writing letters to politicians at all levels, sending deputations to them. They'd got nowhere until they turned in desperation to the New South Wales branch of the Builders, Liber Builders Labourers Federation after reading about its commitment to the social responsibility of labour. So the BL saved Kelly's Bush, a public reserve on the harbour foreshore from private development because they believed that environmental interests transcended other considerations, such as Hunters Hill being a posh area. And from that time on, a fascinating alliance of environmentalists and construction workers prevented $5 billion worth of environmental damage at 1970s prices of so-called development. There have been experiments in simpler lifestyle living, from Nimbin in the 1970s to contemporary eco-communities. There's the founding of Green Parties, which are often seen as single issue, but are much more than that, and in Australia at least, arguably more social democratic than the Labor Party. Since the 1990s, environmentalists have pushed the urgent need for just transition for workers affected by the phasing out of fossil fuels. And this notion was taken up two decades ago by the international trade union movement. In Australia, environmentalists and, and, um, and unions have helped um, people in regions such as the, the Hunter Valley, the Latrobe Valley and Collie to act collectively together to develop just transition plans for their area. Fifthly, there have been school kids strikes, as we know, to express the anger of future voters. There have been non-violent direct actions from tree hugging to Extinction Rebellion. Um, of course, these have antecedents, as Sean's study of Gandhi in the West uh, points out. 
And finally, I'd say that there's been um, court case activism. Uh, for example, that case that the environment minister has a duty of care to future generations. Environmentalism has articulated new visions of democracy in that, firstly, it's producing, is in the process of producing a less binary democracy as the two-party system fractures under onslaught from Greens on the left and Teals in the middle. But this is a slow and messy process. First past the post voting and single member constituencies in many countries impede new parties. But in any case, we have to ask our Green parties the answer to ecological crisis. Does power really reside in parliaments? Or are there serious pressures from powerful forces with a continuing interest in environmental damage that make it difficult or even impossible for parliaments to legislate to save the planet? Is it possible to create a deeper ecological democracy, as Robin Eckersley proposes, uh, for a green state, that participation and representation should be extended to all potentially affected by a decision? regardless of location, age, gender or species? And how would such a green state be brought about? Uh, pardon my scepticism, I doubt it would come from above. It might possibly come from below, but only temporarily, as in the Green Bands movement, which insisted successfully that the people most affected by a decision should have a say in what was built and how. But that argument succeeded only because environmentalists were supported by those with power at the point of production, the builders' labourers who withdrew their labour from damaging projects. So the polity was forced to take notice. The blah, blah, blah stopped for a while and stuff happened. For example, the people's plan for the rocks, which gave us what is there today, enjoyed by tourists, praised by today's politicians, instead of the monstrous plan that the developers and politicians of 50 years ago wanted, concrete and glass skyscrapers, a nasty extension to the central business district. And that was only prevented from happening by workers' power uh, wielded, ecolo wielded ecologically in the interests of the environment. And there are many other parts of Sydney and other parts of um, other capital cities that owed their continuing existence. and the existence of that environment continuing into the future because of workers' power. But as Jack Mundy said at the time, this was only a temporary fix, that somehow or other the system had to change to make green bands unnecessary. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Sean. I'd like to associate myself with um, the um, acknowledgements of, of uh, the traditional owners and uh, country that have already been made. Um, when I found myself tutoring uh, for some colleagues in a Cold War history course a few years back, one of my tasks uh, was to explain something to young undergraduates that is likely to come as a surprise, I think, to many of them, that the movement against communist rule in Poland in the 1980s was led by an electrician, Lech Walesa, and a trade union organisation, Solidarity. There's probably little, I suspect, in their own immediate experience that would lead them to imagine that political transformation on a grand scale might happen that way, even as Amazon workers in the United States organise, a former, former metal worker and union leader resumes the presidency in Brazil, and Australia has its first serious national debate for many years about the right to strike. The need um, for a leap of the imagination among students such as these possibly owes much to, to straightforward deunionisation, a process familiar enough in the Australian context. At the time, former ACTU advocate and president Bob Hawke became prime minister in 1983. About one in every two employees belonged to a union. A decade later, it was about four in 10, and changes in the nature of the economy, the workforce and industrial law would push those percentages lower in the years ahead. Union density today is probably around 14% of the workforce with heavy concentrations in education, health, the professions and public sector employment. In one sense, decline, of course, has seen democratisation. Women are clearly more conspicuous as union members and as union officials and leaders than even a generation ago. And there are, moreover, perhaps 1.4 million unionists in Australia, which in raw numbers makes Labor a social movement to be reckoned with. Campaigning unions have had their successes over recent decades, notably in the campaign against the Howard government's work choices legislation. 
And unions have considerable democratic legitimacy, I think, uh, much more than I suspect um, was the case uh, in the 1970s and uh, perhaps even the 80s. Um, the exposure of corruption and criminality in the health services union a few years ago should not divert us from the point that with Australian Electoral Commission oversight of union elections, Unions conform rather better to democratic norms than political parties. And I also think the organising model of unionism, which is often um, contrasted, I guess, with a, a kind of service or service delivery model, um, in its emphasis on, on grassroots mobilisation and networks, um, is arguably um, a more valuable contribution to democracy than the service model in its focus on a form of mobilisation at, at the local or grassroots level, or the workplace level. A return to the very origins of the labour movement in Australia can help us grapple with the complicated relationship of labour to democracy in this country. I mean, the work of Terry Irving on the emergence of radical and working class politics in New South Wales in the 1830s and 1840s has disclosed the significant role that this democratic movement played in the process of shaping self-government in this country. He moved them really from the margins, I think, to something much closer to the centre in his accounts of the evolution of responsible government. Similarly, in Victoria, the gold rushes had a radicalising effect that would find expression in movements for the eight-hour day and for the unlocking of the lands to free selectors. And as Ray Markey has shown, the unions that emerged in the second half of the 19th century were often small local organisations of skilled workers, but they were highly democratic in their structure ethos and organisation. They perhaps prefigure in some ways that organising model I just mentioned. Markey argues that it was with the rising power of the more centralised bush or country union, the Australian Workers' Union, and the orientation of unions towards the industrial arbitration system that they became less democratic and more bureaucratic. Now, historians have sometimes presented early unionists as conservative and exclusive because of the skilled nature of their work, their domination by white men, and the supposedly sectional and exclusive character of their campaigns and organisations. They are also said to be preoccupied with wages and conditions and little interested in wider political commitments. My program, 10 bob a day, so a, a, an Australian unionist famously told a visiting Frenchman in the late 1890s, a line that historians have often quoted. But the early unions were part of a nascent um, radical and democratic movement agitating alongside gold miners, shopkeepers, small farmers and middle class radicals for miners' rights, land reform, political democracy and shorter hours of work. There were also tentative steps towards the organisation of female labour uh, in that 19th century period. The Melbourne Tayloresses Union was established in 1882 with the assistance of male craft unionists in the clothing trade. It soon had 2,000 members and was involved in a major strike in 1882-83. But male unionists also feared and opposed the spread of female labour, just as some agitated against Chinese workers in industries such as furniture making. As historical research between the 1970s and 1990s disclosed, this defensive, sexist and racist aspect to Australian Labor's activities um, is, is rather important. And it became harder, I think, to see the way that Labor had constituted democracy. I'd venture to suggest that this was a failing of the Labor history of that era. The baby might have been thrown out with the bathwater. The insight offered by Veer Gordon Child's 1923 study, How Labor Governments, later explored by Terry Irving, that the Labor Party crafted a distinctive understanding of democracy, was overlooked because it was all too easy to recognise the exclusions practised by party and unions. Yet it's notable that the organisation of women workers into unions accompanied the achievement of female suffrage. The re precise relationship between them, I think, is uh, um, harder to untangle. So in December 1910, the Melbourne Trades Hall Council called on, and I quote, all unionists to use their best endeavours to assist in organising women workers as many of their relatives are still out of their respective unions. In October of that same year, unions covering dressmakers, bookbinders and stationary employees and women working in jam, pickle and sauce trades were formed here in Melbourne. Alan Mulcahy, a union organiser, received 327 applications from female bootmakers to join the union in one evening in 1911. And she was also instrumental in the organisation of female confectionery employees, cigarette makers, laundry workers, furniture trade operatives, clerks and office cleaners in 1910 and 1911. I'm just focusing here on a particular moment of mobilisation. 
Waitresses, match workers and domestic servants were being organised by this time, and activists such as Mulcahy, Minnie Felstead, challenged the notion that women were interlopers on industry. Felstead commented in 1909, and I quote here, woman as a wage earner was steadily improving her position. Her place in the industrial world was not temporary as she had decidedly come to stay. Now look, there are dangers of overcorrection here. We might well end up with an unduly celebratory account of Labor's contribution to democracy. But we surely need to find a place for Labor and the Aboriginal rights movement as well when we find activists such as Fred Maynard in 1927 explaining that the union movement was seeking to establish conditions that resembled those of Australia before the white invasion when, and I quote, men only worked when necessary, called no master man and had no king. Eddie Marbo's rise to prominence in Indigenous political activism in the 1960s was entangled with his union activism and very likely, likely inter integral to it in providing him with opportunities for cooperating with white allies and speaking in public, organisational skills. And key moments in the internal decolonisation of Australia, such as the 1946 Pilbara Pastoral Workers' Strike, the 1966 Gurindji Strike, were entangled in labour and communist politics, even as Indigenous people drew on their own resources of self-government and connections to country. There's a larger story too, now increasing well known, we've just heard um, an aspect of that from the, the leading authority on it, um, the intersections between labour and other social movements such as environmentalism in the Green Ban era, era as in Meredith and Verity, and Verity Bergman's work, uh, intersections with feminism explored for instance by one of my own students, Freya Willis, in relation to clerks and meat workers in the 1970s. Sam Oldham has examined the rise and impact of shop floor activism in the 1970s, industrial democracy. Um, so I think in such ways unions have contributed to the reinvigoration of democracy through a reconstitution of the boundaries of citizenship. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sean. Um, I'd like to begin by paying my respects to the Wiradjuri peoples and their elders past and present on whose land we meet. And I'd like to thank Sean and the Academy of Social Sciences for the invitation to speak on this panel. I've been asked to discuss the women's movement, the movement known in the 19th century in the singular as the woman movement, as all women then were as one in their exclusion from political rights in the white man's democracy forged in the 1850s in the southeastern colonies of Australia that introduced manhood suffrage 50 years, some almost 50 years before womanhood suffrage. When New South Wales Republican Democrat Daniel Dennehy celebrated the triumph of what he called glorious manhood in the 1850s, he, its elevation, as he put it, over rank and status and title and over women, he spoke proudly of the gendered nature of colonial democracy. Manhood was everything. In the Australian colonies, manhood suffrage even initially extended to include Aboriginal and Chinese men. This would change. Women's social movements have always been, I think, political movements. Maybe all social movements are really political movements. But women, unlike many who comprise a social movement, are not a minority. We comprise around half the population. We're not, of course, united in our interests or perspectives or position, intersectionality sees to that, yet we are still able to represent women's situation in general terms statistically, as journalist Matt Wade did the other day in the Age newspaper. He reported that the gender pay gap remains, hovering between 13 and 19 per cent during the last few decades. One reason is that the share of women in part-time work is twice that of men, and women are much more likely to be in insecure and casual jobs often performing various forms of care work, such as aged care, hospital care, NDIS, child care, after school care, as well as unpaid care in their own homes. Furthermore, as a result of unequal wages over such a long period of time, the median super balance for men is 24% more than for women. And beyond the economic indicators, but related to them, importantly, there are the statistics on sexual harassment, sexual and domestic violence, violence against women and children, murder. Women are much more likely to be killed or injured by their partner than are men. As I noted, these phenomena are related, 
Because of their responsibility for care work, many women are still economically dependent on men, especially women with children. They are thus especially vulnerable to coercion and violence. If they leave abusive partners, they are likely to live in poverty or to be killed. One woman is murdered, it's reported, by a partner or former partner every week in Australia. Almost more shocking is the statistic that almost 10 women a day are hospitalised, 10 women a day, for assault injuries perpetrated by a spouse or domestic partner. These vulnerabilities are worse for trans, trans women and women dis with disabilities, and much worse for Indigenous women. In 2018 to 19, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women had 20 ti 29 times the rate of hospitalisation for non-fatal family violence assaults compared with non-Indigenous women. After around 170 years of manhood suffrage and some 140 years of Australian women's political activism, democracy doesn't seem to have worked so well for half the population. Women remain vulnerable to daily violence, exploited in unpaid or poorly paid work, and work longer hours than men. Women remain the weary sex, in William Lane's evocative description in the novel The Working Man's Paradise. The weary sex. Working mothers are still harassed, bullied, and belittled in paid work. As journalist Jenna Price noted the other day, again in The Age, what a good newspaper, Life for women journalists has entailed, she said, quote, decades of mothers being marginalised from the main game. Managers sarcastically thanking us for dropping in at work on our way to pick up the children. Women journalists have watched women get managed out, she said, because of the inconvenience of their family lives. When you research Australian women's political history over the last 140 years, you will find clear and continuing patterns in the political demands made by women and their numerous organisations. The two most explicit and long-lasting of women's stated political goals have been to achieve the economic independence of women and the protection of women and children from men's violence. They believed that the former would assist in achieving the latter. Suffragists emphasised their hope that female enfranchisement would lead not to more of the same in politics, but the introduction of what they called a new element in political life. They expected to make a profound difference to gender relations, not to simply create a few political careers for a few women. In his Age article, Matt Wade asked whether men were yet ready to work for equality. This was the gist of his article. Women's involvement in the labour market, he says, is changing to become more like men's. But there's not been a corresponding change in households. The behaviour of women and men in that realm has not shifted much at all. This is most apparent in households with children. In other words, women have had to assimilate to men's ways of work their priorities, daily rhythms and life patterns. Successful assimilation has been the main game. But now it is surely men's turn to change. Matt Wade's age headline asked, are men up to the challenge? Interestingly and significantly, I think, the goal of reforming masculinity, quote, and the relations between husbands and wives was also one of the main goals of the late 19th century woman movement right through into the early decades of the 20th century. There's, there's surprising continuity. Women's care work was and remains a major source of their exploitation, vulnerability and inequality. And not just childcare. Women's care work for infants, the young and the old, for the disabled, the sick and the frail, whether unpaid or poorly paid, is a major source of their continuing oppression. In the 1970s, women's liberationists theorised this phenomenon as the sexual division of labour. And their solutions were, broadly, to get women into men's jobs and institutionalised childcare. Women's political history, the political history of women in Australia over the long haul, shows that women activists have been aware of the punitive effects of responsibility for care work on women's lives and their consequent vulnerability if economically dependent on men. They've been aware of this for a very long time and advocated varying and changing policies to address it moving over time from a framework of state socialism, as it used to be called provision by the state, to neoliberal emphasis on getting women into the labour market. In the late 19th century, Louisa Lawson considered marital abuse so common, she likened the bedroom to a chamber of horrors. She edited the feminist journal Dawn. Another leader of the New South Wales suffrage movement, Rose Scott, also, like 
um, Lawson received many letters from women detailing their daily oppression. One woman wrote to Scott and said, he simply about her husband, he simply would have me be his slave, not his wife. He said he would make me obey him. He would make me do just what he chose or murder me. He would teach me who he was. In a lecture in 1903 called The Economic Independence of the Married Woman, Scott emphasised the moral and psychological effects on wives of, women's, um, of men's enforcement of their conjugal rights. Rights, by the way, which were really rendered illegal until the 1980s. In the Australian way, feminists initially looked to the state to bring economic independence to women through their three-plank platform of equal pay, motherhood endowment and childhood endowment. Motherhood endowment was recognition, as Miru Hegney put it, the labour organiser, a minimum, minimum income as an individual right. And she said such an innovation would bring, she said, revolutionary changes in the relations of husband and wife, especially, she noted, for working class women. And my goodness, my time has nearly run out, so I'm going to skip a couple of pages. Um, gender equality demands that we address more fundamental issues, including the devaluation of care work, which represents a devaluation of women's work, and, and of women, just as domestic and sexual violence arise from a profound hostility towards, if not hatred, of women. One of the reasons the pro popular cross-class proposal um, for motherhood endowment was defeated in the mid-20th century was because it was opposed by organising work, organised working-class men, by labour men, who insisted on getting paid the higher wage so that not only they could um, pay for maintenance for their children, but have women to do their domestic work for them. To achieve economic independence, women would have to go out to work like men, but unlike men, they would need to find childcare. And many are still looking for it as we speak. Childcare workers, like aged care workers, are in short supply. Thank you. Thanks, Sean. Um, the title for this talk actually came from a discussion I've had several times with Anne Summers, who has said to me, on a number of occasions that she thinks the gay movement, which we now have to call the LGBTIQA++, and I feel sorry for the SBS announcers who get stuck with this every night, um, but Anne's point is that the gay movement has been more successful than the women's movement, and listening to Marilyn, one might well think that's the case. I actually think it's much more complicated than that. Um, I think in both cases we can, we can either have a half full or a half empty view of what's happened. I think the one thing that is clear is that things are very different uh, to the situation that existed, say, 50 years ago. But I wanted to um, address the topic by taking three moments in fairly recent political history. Um, and I do, in doing this, have to overlook the really significant role that a number of lesbians played in the women's movement, uh, which really doesn't fit exactly into the three cases I'm going to talk about. The first is the decriminalisation of homosexual behaviour, which in Australia came late. Uh, we were behind Britain. We were, of course, ahead of the United States, as we are in so many other areas of life, um, which actually begins with a motion in the House of Representatives moved by John Gorton and Moss Cass in the early 1970s, but really stems from law reform in South Australia in 1975 uh, under the premiership of Don Dunstan. It ends in the mid-90s when the last state to decriminalise was Tasmania, and Tasmania decriminalised, and this is where it becomes a very interesting, bigger story in terms of thinking about democracy and thinking about Australia within an international world, which I don't think we've really touched on as much as we might. Activists in Tasmania used the, hum the United Nations Human Rights Convention to get a ruling that the existing Tasmanian laws that criminalised male homosexual behaviour were inconsistent with Australia's commitment to human rights, following which the then Hawke government used federal power to, in effect, override the Tasmanian Legislative Council. 
And there are, of course, all sorts of implications. I don't think, and I'm looking at people in the audience who know this much better than I do, I think that is the only time in our history when we have been able to use the United Nations Human Rights Convention to overrule, am I right? I think so. Yes, but yes, but but the point is, it was the ability of activists to appeal to an international tribunal. The second moment that I want to talk about, or at least put on the table, is the AIDS epidemic in the mid 80s. Now, there's a whole history. There are many histories, indeed, of the AIDS epidemic. But in terms of what we're talking about today, there are, I think, two things that are really significant. The first is that for the first time in our history, an Australian government felt that it needed to involve affected communities in developing a response to an epidemic. I have fond memories of sitting on one of the very many advisory panels. I have very fond memories of sitting with Elizabeth Reid in a number of meetings, but I have particular memories of sitting in an advisory committee between a representative of sex workers and the Archbishop of Melbourne. And I think that's a wonderful moment. And that, I think, is really important if we're thinking in broader terms about participation and accountability. The other thing that I think the AIDS epidemic did for Australia is it opened up the language of sexuality research. It funded a lot of research that otherwise wouldn't have happened, and it made conversations possible. And indeed, again, a memory, a lovely memory, sitting in a room behind Ita Buttrose, who played a very important role in this history. Ita was quietly buffing her nails as someone on the platform was talking about anal sex. <laughs> I think that is a lovely historical moment. And the third, and of course the most obvious one, is the debate over marriage. And in fact, although it was a postal vote, for some reason when people talk about referenda, as they did in the previous session, they passed over the fact that we in effect had a successful referendum only a few years ago, and that against expectations, parts of Australia that were thought to be the most homophobic I'm thinking of Rockhampton, Townsville, Northwest Tasmania, Inland WA, all those electorates voted yes. One of the really fascinating aspects of that vote, something I keep trying to persuade George Megalaganis he should be more interested in, is that eight of the ten electorates with the highest no vote are actually in Sydney. And I think that the marriage referendum, to me, symbolises a very significant shift in Australia, whereby Melbourne, rather than Sydney, has become the centre of radicalism and progressivism in this country. I think where I want to end is to reflect on the current apparent respectability of what I like to call queer. I don't think it is possible for Netflix now to produce a series without at least several people who have a sexuality or gender identity that is not uh, consistent with what uh, Raywan Connell would call hegemonic masculinity. And I think this is reflected in all sorts of ways that are, for me, as someone who's lived through a lot of these ch changes, extremely heartening. The fact that we have an openly lesbian foreign minister would have been inconceivable even 30 years ago. And in fact, just to make a bit of a digression, because I think it's important, none of us really, including myself, have I think reflected enough on how the changes we're talking about are actually a mirror of the way in which Australia has changed demographically. What I hear too often is almost an implicit sense that in Australia we have the Anglos and the Indigenous, but of course it's much more complicated than that. 
And I don't think we have, as a panel, and I include myself, I don't think we've addressed that sufficiently. But certainly all the movements that we're talking about have had to come to terms with this. And I think uh, it's something I hope we come back to in the final discussion. I was very struck by the references that I think both Frank and Marilyn have made using the term citizenship. Because I think what we're really talking about is an increase in the possibilities for people who were previously marginalised, criminalised, stigmatised, to actually feel they are full citizens. A road that, as we know, and as we heard so movingly just before lunch, is still not the experience of very many Indigenous Australians. And while I could point to all sorts of problems that remain, and certainly I could point to the very unhealthy homophobia and transphobia that exists in some sections of the Conservative parties, I actually want to end on a positive note. Next year, World Pride is coming to Sydney. Now, for those of you who don't know, just World Pride is essentially Mardi Gras on steroids, and the New South Wales government love it because they're going to fill the hotels in the CBD with wealthy Americans. Uh, you, may, you may hear in this a little bit of cynicism. You have the right to hear that if you so wish. But what I think is interesting is that part of World Pride, there will be a march across the Sydney Harbour Bridge and I think this is only the second time that a state government has said we will close the bridge to allow a march. The first, of course, was for the stolen generation. That, I think, is a mark for me of progress and success. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to present today to my old mate, Sean, for bringing this panel together. I do have a, do a bad dose of FOMO and regret not being able to participate in person. I acknowledge the, Gadigal, the land of the Gadigal people where I am today and my own family and grasslands, uh, Gummeroy country, in part represented in this um, uh, Pilliga image, artistic representation of the Pilliga forest. So just to let you know, my presentation includes reference to two and images of people who, have, who are deceased. Um, in this presentation today, I share some insights from my research on the movement for Aboriginal land rights in New South Wales and with attention to Sean's provocation uh, about how social movements shaped Australian democracy. Thinking about the movement and the laws that were passed in 1983 and that have been the focus of my um, study, um, What Do We Want?, that was published in 2015, um, I you know, I think there's some really interesting themes um, that are teased out slightly differently when we think about the workshop theme today, democracy. And I particularly think, you know, focus on Aboriginal land rights called on the state uh, to act in a way that addressed the social justice claims of Aboriginal citizens built as it was, um, as it has been on a history of violence, erasure and exclusion from accepted citizenship entitlements. By the midnight 20th century and in the context of emerging human rights discourse, um, these have been addressed in terms of assimilation, improved marginally to one of inclusion. By the 1970s, the articulation and eventual comprehension by governments of Aboriginal land rights ushered in a revolution in political discourse. In New South Wales, Aboriginal land rights might be read as mechanisms for Aboriginal active citizenship that sought to counter prevailing and deeply embedded power relations that extended through and beyond the state. And secondly, democratisation of governments. Um, moving through here, these are some of the key points I will address. Um, uh, but here you will be familiar with the land titling revolution that has been underway since the late 1960s and its uneven character. I'll be speaking about New South Wales, but I urge you to look at the um, southeastern New South Wales and, um, and comprehend the unevenness of the uh, land titling revolution. What I'm speaking about are these... Um, uh, these the purple dots, um, this kind of measles type um, pattern, um, these small uh, parts of land that have been returned in New South Wales under the New South Wales Aboriginal Land Rights Act. 
1978, the New South Wales government had been convinced land rights was the key to advance justice for Aboriginal people in the state. And by November, an inquiry was underway with the appointment of a cross-party select committee. The 1978 inquiry was initially to report on the underlying causes of socioeconomic disadvantage, Commonwealth state relations and land rights until welcome intervention by the skillful Aboriginal elders and activist network they enabled saw land rights elevated to a separate top order item and expanded to include sacred and significant sites. The committee reported its findings to government in 1980. Land rights laws were drafted by December 1982 and legislated in March 1983. So next March uh, marks the 40th anniversary of land rights. Um, it was a writing about this period. It was um, I immensely enjoyed writing about it. It's an incredible period of time. Um, and the movement for land rights, the inquiry and the laws that were passed brought about significant change in Aboriginal people, in government and the way each now interact. Whereas we might be more familiar with oppressive accounts of the exercise of power in colonial and settler states, here was a moment when the settler government was reckoning with its more than 200-year history of land dealings and fashioning under the weight of history of violent dispossession, a response that served Aboriginal interests and that managed the politics of redistributing public assets. Aboriginal people were also engaging in trusting and optimistic ways with government, coming up with options and crafting their future. Spoiler alert, disappointment was to come. They were organising, building successful alliances. There was intimacy with government that had never existed before, um, before this moment. So here... Um, the 1978 land inquiry saw the Aboriginal land demand gain momentum, become more expansive, and for activists to make their demands more, co more coherent, cogent and politically persuasive. So much so that politician and 1978 inquiry chair Maury Keane gleefully reflected in an interview with me, its time had come. Defence of land has been continuous from the, from the um, you know, from the moment... Um, um, you know, the, from the moment of invasion. But the expression of that defence and activism was shaped by different circumstances, conditions and possibilities. The land demand was and continues to be a demand that shifts and changes in concert with changing ideas, political and legal poss possibilities and social, social and economic conditions. Some of those conditions I would I highlight was that the revocation of the remaining Aboriginal lands from the 1920s and intensica intensification of the revocation of those reserves from the 1960s, these lands known as reserves and missions, was registered as successive and new ways of land loss that posed risk to the security and livelihood of Aboriginal families and in a settling where many Aboriginal people successfully engaged with the modernising expectations of European worlds. So we can see here um, the election in the mid-1970s of the RAND government. It was known as a RAND slide. They had political capital and they were ready to, um, to respond to the Aboriginal land demand amongst a range of other reforms. So um, there's a lot I'm leaving out here, but I do want to highlight some key points. One is that in the early 70s, Fikatsi increasingly shifted their focus on land justice that had been um, sidelined in favour of the uh, citizenship and the referendum. And there were new activists coming to the fore. They were organising through a group known as the Black Defence Group. They drew together Aboriginal people in from active in various unions and other activist groups. And they were heavily influenced by South Coast elders, uh, Jack Campbell and um, Ted Gabu Thomas, who encouraged these younger activists. Um, Marcia Langton was amongst them, um, Bob Blair, Kevin Cook, um, to focus their efforts on land rights. And what they argue to these young activists who were organising around Redfern is that land rights is the issue. So they were saying, um, and I quote from some of them, that once we deal with land rights, um, other issues um, will, will follow. So with this with this influence, the group, Black Defence Group, went on to organise a statewide land rights conference in 1977. Um, Kevin Cook, 
um, they formed the New South Wales Aboriginal Land Council. This was totally independent of government. Kevin Cook continued to take a leadership role. Um, they were instrumental in pressuring the New South Wales government to respond to the Aboriginal land demand. Both Bob Blair and Kevin Cook sat on the 1978, uh, by 1978, on the New South Wales Labor Party's, you know, Aborigines policy. Um, they pushed for this. They had vital networks amongst the trade union within the ALP. Um, uh, Kevin Cook was based at Tramby. They established a group, such, including the Trade Union Council for Aboriginal Rights, which allowed for wide and quick dissemination. Um, but more so, what we have here, and I'll just finish up on this because I can see the clock winding down, is an, a government that were really ready and interested in engaging differently with Aboriginal people. And this is how the 1978 inquiry was conducted. These photos uh, are from Wallaga Lake, and you, you can see Jack Campbell and Gabu Thomas, the elected pol the, um, politicians who were sat on the Select Committee inquiry up the front um, down on Wallaga uh, Wallaga Mission or the Reserve. Um, so here, the committee, that Land Inquiry Committee established an Aboriginal task force. Uh, Pat O'Shane chaired that task force. Um, Marcia Langton, Kevin Gilbert, um, Burnham Burnham, um, many, several others were part of that task force and they functioned as a go-between. So here were these members of parliament visiting communities they accepted submissions from the community in a range of different um, formats. So the South Coast community, for instance, um, submitted their um, um, submission in this beautiful bound um, black and white photographic essay that was their submission to the inquiry. You can see here members of the parliament. This is at a, a chip, cotton chipping camp in Wee War. They're in a very unfamiliar circumstance um, situation. Um, they're very uncomfortable. They're very discomforted by uh, the, the, their observance of a lack of running water, of electricity, um, and they come back and um, uh, and um, put up a um, an eventual land rights uh, response that it, it, it still today is the most substantial land rights response in the country. And just, um, I know I'm out of time, but let me just say that some key features of the land rights laws um, include the creation of a 120 or so local Aboriginal land councils across the state. And Frank Walker, who became um, the, who drafted the land rights laws, who became the inaugural Minister for Aboriginal Affairs and created the Ministry of Aboriginal Affairs that Pat O'Shane came to be appointed to head up. He described in an interview with me these local Aboriginal land councils as political cells. So they imagined the structure of land rights as being um, something of, a, of the creation of an Aboriginal polity, of an Aboriginal form of government that would interact with the other spheres of government. So I'll, I'll wind up there, but it, um, just to conclude by saying that this land rights, it was the actual process of the inquiry. The eventual laws recognised a form of Aboriginal political power and through the land estate, land and wealth generation to realise economic power. Terrific. Thank you uh, very much, Heidi, and thanks to all of our speakers. Because they've all uh, sat within the 10 uh, minutes required, that means we have plenty of time for the next part of the session. So to remind you, the next part of the session invites each of our speakers to address the relationship between social movements, so not just focusing on their given social movement, but uh, between social movements, and also to more explicitly consider uh, the future of democracy and the place of social movements in democratic reimagination. So the first person who has five minutes for that uh, is Verity Bergman. Right. Uh, thanks, Sean. Now, social movements typically represent circumstances scribe constituencies such as workers, women, First Nations people, gay people, etc. The environmental movement is unusual in that it claims to represent the real interests of all humans in survival on a livable planet. Does its universalism make connections with other movements easier? I'm not sure. Um, I'll look at just four of these in the time allowed. Well, firstly, there's a link with First Nations movements on at least two levels. Uh, care of country, sometimes native title rights, is often an important component of environmental protection campaigns. For example, Jabaluki 
um, Jabaluka, Anti Adani, Beetaloo Basin, etc. And outside Australia, the campaign to protect the Amazon is clearly a combination of Indigenous rights activism and environmentalism. And also, First Nations ways of living have much to teach the planet's other inhabitants about how to live in ways that show greater respect for the environment and in that way mitigate climate crisis, uh, that to be is much more important than to have. Secondly, with the women's movement, there's an interesting philosophical link in eco-feminist thinking, which is strong in Australia, uh, which claims there's a connection between the patriarchal domination of women and the ecologically destructive exploitation of the earth. That patriarchy has equated women and nature and downvalued and exploited both. Uh, Ecofeminism seeks to revalue both women and nature, but without denying an equation. Thirdly, there are increasing alliances between human rights activists and environmentalists because use of the environment is clearly linked to issues of human rights and justice. The worst forms of pollution, such as toxic waste and pesticides, are suffered disproportionately by the poor, the disadvantaged, racial and ethnic minorities. Um, they are seen as people who do not matter so much and also as people less likely to be able to offer effective resistance due to lack of resources and influence. In the United States, this is a very strong alliance. An environmental justice movement there declares the right of all people to share equally in the benefits bestowed by a healthy environment, and it uses legislation and lawsuits to equalise the chances of citizens to avoid pollution and live healthily. Uh, in Australia, uh, the Our Islands, Our Home campaign recently made international legal history when the United Nations found that the Australian government violated human rights obligations to Torres Strait Islanders by failing to act on climate change. And finally, the labour movement, uh, obviously I've talked a lot about this in the um, first talk, the, the Green Bands movement showed how workers' power can benefit environmental campaigns, how connections between environmentalists and workers is, is an incredibly powerful alliance. Uh, we also um, know that the limited successes of the movement against uranium mining um, 50 years ago, 40 years ago, depended on uh, certain unions refusing to shift the stuff. Um, and of course, they were then sold out by the ACTU bureaucracy, but they did get somewhere at least in limiting um, that, that dangerous activity. At a more bureaucratic level, uh, unions and their peak bodies have worked for decades with environmentalists on climate action. Uh, for example, back in 1991-1992, the ACTU published an incredibly prescient pamphlet called The Greenhouse Effect. It called for transition to a greener economy, if only the Labor government of the time had taken notice. Paul Keating wasn't interested. Uh, then through the Green Jobs initiatives of the 1990s uh, and this millennium, the ACTU's insistence that climate change is core union business and its active support with just transition uh, initiatives. It's interesting that in um, the Risk Society, Ulrich Beck ignored organised labour in confronting environmental risk, yet workers are crucial. Finally, I recently um, wrote about the importance of being extreme, how social movements typically achieve reforms by having a radical flank that demands more than mere reform. So the moderates in that movement emerge as the voice of compromise and reason that gains valuable reforms. Unfortunately, because of tipping points creating runaway climate change, mere reforms might be useless. Unlike other social movements, environmentalism might only be able to aid democracy by achieving its maximum program of reducing emissions much, much faster than short-sighted governments are proposing. Thank you. Thank you, Verity. And so now I invite Frank to return. Uh, thanks, Sean. I mean, um, I think there's a danger here of me repeating the kinds of things that uh, Verity and probably others will say. So um, I'm going to reflect on, um, I guess, what we've, we've said, you know, what we've actually said today, uh, rather than in a more abstract sense. And 
I suppose um, you know one way in which uh, I, I guess um, many of us thought about um, the, the, the relationship of the labour movement or the union movement to other, other social movements uh, a few decades back was in terms of a, a labour movement's materialist politics and that concept of of post-materialism that the environmental movement, for instance, has often been associated with. Um, you know, I think all of the things that have been said today uh, indicate the ways in which those distinctions are, are, are rather unreal. I mean, Verity pointing to that intimate relationship between equality and sorry, inequality, I should say, particularly global inequality and uh, climate change, the north-south distinction. Um, uh, also, Verity's work on, on the green bands and the, the kinds of class alliances um, that uh, sat behind those, uh, which also, of course, prefigure some of the alliances we've seen in recent years between farmers and, and environmentalists around uh, land use uh, and, and climate change. Um, Marilyn's work talks really about um, the uh, um, ways in which both, I think, um, non-party feminists and to some extent feminists more closely associated with the labour movement, I think probably Muriel Hegney would be an example of that, um, developed a critique of a male-centred um, economic wages and welfare system. I guess it's Frank, you know, the, the term Frank Castles used was the wage earners welfare state, um, but worked by Marilyn and, and others emphasised the extent to which that wage earners welfare state was also a masculinist welfare state based on uh, a male-centred concept of the basic wage. Um, and as Marilyn points out, I mean, women's votes didn't eliminate patriarchy uh, or structural inequality which uh, remain with us. Um, but I guess I'm also conscious of the work of, of people, I see Marion Sawyer right in front of me here, of the ways in which certain aspects of, of the welfare state uh, of the early 20th century uh, did um, uh, uh, disclose, I think, um, some of the influences of uh, women's voting and women's electoral power. And Marion has pointed, for instance, to an age pension funded out of consolidated revenue, paid equally to men and women, not, different, not differential rates, uh, and, and indeed paid individually to men and women rather than as some sort of family unit. Um, and uh, uh, Marion has also pointed, I think, to the ways in which uh, the, the maternity uh, allowance, so the Fisher government's maternity allowance, can also be seen in the context of uh, women's rights rather than that, I guess, an older idea that it's somehow a baby, a baby bonus. Um, it was all about sort of um, countering the decline in the birth rate. Um, Dennis, um, talking about that, that massive transformation um, in uh, the position of um, uh, queer people, of, of, I won't use the LGBT because I will get lost too, but um, gays and lesbians across um, those decades. Um, we know uh, from, from, again, from Verity and Meredith Bergman's work about the, the role of the BLF in that kind of activism in the 1970s alongside Green bands, um, they took up the issue of, of the rights of gays and lesbians. Um, uh, one thinks here also of uh, the uh, place of gay and lesbian rights activism within teachers' unionism, in which there's been some interesting work uh, in, well, not even recent years, it goes back some way. And of course, Dennis pointed out that, that um, uh, those achievements really in terms of um, uh, the you know, dealing with AIDS as an issue occurred under a Labor government. It is worth asking ourselves whether it would have been the same under a different kind of government in the 1980s. And then finally, Heidi, um, you know, speaking there of the role, emphasised the role of, of unions and the ALP in Indigenous activism, which I also brought up at the end of my paper. And I, I think she also points to the way in which Indigenous people have been able to use the spaces and opportunities provided by a colonial state that wasn't designed to advance their interests or to help their interests, but it, it, did, it has opened up spaces. Um, she uses the example of, of New South Wales land rights activism because that's a part of a much longer lineage that we can see going back, for instance, in this state you know, to, to the heroic struggles at Corran Dirk um, over many decades, a couple of decades, uh, the, the William Cooper, who we've also heard about today. I think that provides something of a hinterland to the story that um, uh, was told there today around Indigenous activism in New South Wales. So we'll leave it. Thanks. Marilyn, go for it. Um, as we go on, there are so many issues to take up, so many things to answer. I, 
you know, I had sort of various points in my mind, but then something Frank said just, um, you know, made me think about the issue of the welfare state. Um, of, I mean, one of the difficulties, isn't it, is the way histories have been written um, and, and the sexist nature of a lot of history. Um, because a lot of my work has actually been about the real welfare state being the maternal and infant welfare state of the early 20th century. And um, I published an article a while ago about the 1912 maternity allowance, um, which I called State Socialism for Australian Mothers. In fact, it was from a conference that Mary and I were both at that one way back about the Fisher Labor government. Um, so I think there's so many things going on here. It's about like how you write, what are social movements, how you write their histories, what do you call a social movement. I mean, the group that doesn't have a social movement here is white men, of course. They don't ha why don't they have a social movement? I mean, this is a serious question because it enables us or stimulates us to think more philosophically, more systematically, more analytically about the very meaning of this term social movement and when they're political movements and why white men don't have one. Class Labor and capital, in a simple answer, is they don't have social movements because they became institutionalised into our democratic parliamentary state. You know, capital and labour are there. And that's where white men's interests went. So the rest of us, as it were, form so things called social movements. So in some ways, all the terms sort of worry me. Um, specifically, I want to take up something Dennis said, which I think is really important. Which we, we I mean, we were, you know, we have, we should, you know, if <laughs> if a book were to come of this, it would surely have to be discussed. And that is the relationship between national nationalism and internationalism, the relationship between national politics and international politics. You know, right from the late 19th century, and then through the League of Nations, and then through the United Nations. Land rights clearly, you know, owe something. The conceptualisation owes something to the ILO Convention in 1957 on tribal populations. Um, the Equal Pay um, Convention of the ILO in 1951 is important to early achievements of um, equal pay in Australia. For example, the New South Wales Teachers Act. Everyone, I'm sure, here knows that New South Wales teachers won equal pay in 1958. You know. Um, there used to be, there's a chapter published a long time ago about the history of Equal Pay that says, you know, Equal Pay was won in the 1900s and in, you know, then and in then and then, and then the pension, the Equal Pay and the Pension Act, and then it was won again in 1958. And then and the person writes, what is it about this thing that has to be won again and again and again? And it's always elusive. Um, and I think in answering that, again, you know, you need to look at the interaction between national reform and international reform, and that these are these are dynamic interactions. Um, and then on on so-called social movements, and Verity and others have raised this. I mean, again, it's sort of difficult, isn't it? Because mo these movements obviously sometimes they're cohesive, but they have vast internal differences. They change over time historically, and so in determining when they have an and when there's intersectionality between the movements, but then there's also diversity and difference and conflict within the movements, you know, and, and who, so those are all issues as well we need to address when we talk about these things called social movements. Thank you. <laughs> I, oh, I was going to say, I still have a, a minute and two seconds of your time, Marilyn. Um, there are times when I think of myself as a political scientist, and I think what really strikes me is that we've all skirted around what I think is the central question, namely the relationship between social movements and mainstream electoral politics. And Verity, when she began, talked about the success of the Greens. Now, I would love to be able to talk about the success of the Greens, but my feeling is the Greens have actually plateaued. Um, that what is interesting, if you look at the Victorian state elections, for example, is the Greens basically have not moved in 10 years. Um, and I think we, we can easily be misled by what happened in the last election uh, in Brisbane, in the case of the Greens, and in inner wealthy Sydney, Melbourne and Perth because of the Teals. 
And when I think about the impact of the movements we've talked about, I can see areas where actually the movements have been very unsuccessful. And I think that climate change, I mean, I'm, I'm with Verity, it is in a sense the overwhelming, overriding question. It is extraordinary that the main opposition party in this country still hasn't embraced any meaningful action on climate change, but that even Labor governments still insist that it is possible to keep mining coal and searching for new oil reserves. So I think we have to actually think much more closely and carefully about how we see the interaction between social movements and electoral politics, and in particular, the extraordinary success of the Labor Party, which I don't think anybody a few years ago would have predicted, but if, as I think is quite likely, New South Wales votes Labor in March, there will only be one jurisdiction left in Australia I'm very happy to say it's Tasmania where I grew up, um, that will have a non-Labor government. And when we think about electoral politics and social movements, we also have to think about representation. I mean, one of the big arguments has always been over the last few years um, that the Conservatives have been particularly bad at bringing women into political positions. But I have mixed feelings about putting identity politics ahead of ideological commitment. In the last election, three openly gay liberal MPs lost their seats. In all cases, no, in two cases they lost them uh, to women, to Teals. In one case they lost it to a Greens gay guy. I don't see that as a loss. I see that as a gain. And I see that as a gain because I think it's more important to ask what people stand for than to ask what their identity is. And of course, the problem with identities is that we tend, therefore, however hard we talk about multiplicity and connections, we tend to always assume a master identity that overrides everything else. But I want to, I mean, I'm so glad Marilyn picked up the question of where do we, do we stop this discussion at the water's edge? To me, the missing ingredient from this whole discussion has been what I think is the most ill-treated group in the Australian polity, namely asylum seekers. The fact that we still are keeping people in offshore detention after, what, 10, at least 10 years. And if we're going to talk about human rights and the failures and successes of our social movements, I hate to say it because if there's a movement I really identify with, it is actually the refugee movement both personally and also politically, I would have to say we have failed. And I think it's a sad note to end on, but I think a very important note to end on, because as long as we keep people imprisoned offshore, we as a country are complicit in the most egregious breach of any standard of human rights. Heidi, uh, good to see you again. Uh, so I invite you for another uh, five-minute uh, intervention, after which we'll have some time for questions and answers. Thank you. Um, earlier, um, I, I tried to map out some of the features that gave, I guess, some of the organising that gave rise to the political will to respond to the Aboriginal land demand in New South Wales. Dennis uh, mentioned the, he's wanting us to tease out the link between social movements and electoral politics. And in a sense, there's a couple of points to highlight there. One is that um, if land rights is just something, um, land rights in the movement for land rights um, in New South Wales, just as one example, um, it was through that we see some amazing uh, mobilisation, indeed something that has a you know much longer history, but we can see the linkages and um, the networks, key charismatic individuals, um, people with inside um, elected politicians and other organisers um, who brought about, um, you know, were able to achieve considerable political momentum. 
um, thinking about this um, at the level of the Aboriginal community, what land rights also enacted was a particular mode of organising and convening. And so, say, in relation to local Aboriginal land councils, of which there are almost 120 or so across New South Wales, in most, um, yeah, uh, most um, uh, towns and quite a few in urban areas, across the city areas, um, that also meant that you um, became part of, um, as I argued in my work, um, I thought about this as the extension of power through and beyond the state. So the techniques of rule became enacted on, on you now, um, whereas you might have been um, gathering under the, you know, awning of the, you know, um, uh, side of the house. Now that same family gathering is converted into a land council meeting um, where there's a quorum, there's minutes, there's a chair, per, you know, there's an elected, per, elected secretary. And um, in, of course, a very bruising encounter with these techniques of rule, you also had to be accountable for every dollar and cent. Um, and so by 19, um, those laws were passed in 1983, and by 1996, the Labor government had put a freeze on the allocation of funding to the Land Council network. And by 1988, the Griner government were elected um, on a very vocal and um, first order priority to abolish land rights. So the uh, sort of experiment of self-determination um, hit Aboriginal people in a very um, hard and complicated way. And um, in looking through closely at those minutes, what people were saying is, whatever happened to self-determination? Why can't we make decisions about where we allocate funds, how we ha hold our meetings and so forth? And of course, once um, what land rights also did was, you know, for an excluded minority um, brought you into the um, not so warm embrace of the state and um, the various mechanisms of accountability and and um, and techniques of rule, as I argued, you know, I'm deploying the governmentality um, sort of language there. So. Um, you know, I think there's a couple of things. One is that not only did the land rights movement create these mechanisms that was an arena for the exercise of political power, organising collectively as um, local Aboriginal land councils, but it also brought you into the operations of um, of of of, this, of the state and the you know techniques and apparatus of rule. And one of them, of course, was um, accountability uh, for public public expenditure and scrutiny from an, from a um, from a hostile public, increasingly hostile public. So. Uh, there are a couple of points I want to raise, but also by, as I mentioned, the Griner government's hostility to land rights from 1988 was met with an incredible campaign um, um, run by the Land Council opposing the Griner government's reform. So many of those earlier alliances held together and now the Land Council and Aboriginal community in New South Wales more broadly had resources, they had money, they had an organisational base, they had these political cells in the form of Land Councils as Frank Walker described them and could mount a successful campaign um, against the Griner government and eventually of course they were unsuccessful in abolishing land rights. Now finally I think there is an ongoing provocation that land rights and um, Aboriginal claims of, of um, to sovereignty continue to assert. And one of them we heard about earlier in, to, in talking about the voice and in other contexts, the language is power sharing and in New South Wales, local decision making. And in these configurations, land councils continue to be important as, um, as the base of political power as having convening power, but they also challenge um, um, the ability of the bureaucracy and of elected politicians to deliver services and to respond to the needs of Aboriginal people. So in that sense, we continue to see that there is a push for an Aboriginal sphere, um, Aboriginal sector in some contexts, we might say Aboriginal polity, um, in the um, more appropriate, more refined, uh, more suitable delivery of um of, of government services and in 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 government in government um, in governance rather that may well um, be instructive um, for other marginal groups um, um, in thinking about um, um, local level local level government. Thank you.
Terrific. Thank you very much, uh, Heidi, and thank you to all of uh, our participants. We have well, almost 10 minutes or so for uh, questions, uh, so please raise your hand and uh, someone will uh, run up to you with a microphone. Yeah, I think Marion uh, here was first and then Ariadne afterwards. Thank you. Uh, I want to go back to something that Marilyn said in, in the earlier part of this session because I think it's quite uh, key to um, the d achievement of more equal and inclusive citizenship. Uh, Marilyn reported on an age journalist talking about the gender pay gap and linking it to women's performance of part-time work. Now, of course, the gender pay gap is calculated on average ordinary hours uh, earnings of full-time workers, so it's nothing to do with part-time work. I mean, once you add in part-time work and, and uh, um, other aspects of remuneration, the gender pay gap goes up to about 30 per cent, and that reflects, of course, the quite disproportionate share of um, part-time paid work which women do because of the disproportionate share of unpaid work which they do. So, I mean, I think that for f further development of equal citizenship, this is absolutely key. The more equal sharing of unpaid work to enable more equal uh, sharing of, of paid work and the opportunities for economic independence uh, which that entails. Yes. Yes, Marion, you're absolutely right. And, um, and you're right too that when you take into all, and you took out all income or part time or benefits or whatever, the, the pay gap, if you like, the earnings, the income between men and women is, va is much more, is much larger. Um, and yes, you're right. I mean, that point about citizenship, one of the things that was really interesting to me when I researched um, the women's, women's politics from sort of post-suffrage, and this was, it was particularly post-suffrage, they'd won the vote. And so Australian women had a long period of time, you know, before those in the US or Britain or anywhere else, to theorise citizenship. And they did it very explicitly. There's a lot of writing and thinking about what does it mean to be a citizen. This is not well known, I think. And in the 1910s and 1920s and 1930s, there was a lot of writing on what does it mean now we're citizens. And it was in that context that they all agreed, cross class, that it meant independence, it meant economic independence, because we can't be equal as citizens unless we have equal economic independence. And it was in that context exactly of that lengthy theorisation of the meaning of citizenship that those demands started to be made. And as I said, they, they tried to win economic independence in, with different policies, in different frameworks, in different ways, and each time was sort of knocked back until they finally had to assimilate to men's ways of doing things. But even so, because the structural inequalities, the structural difference in unpaid care, etc., remains. Um, so the inequality remains. But thank you. Yes, you're right. So Ariadne. Uh, fantastic panel. Thanks for organising, Sean. Uh, it was really great and exciting to hear. So I think I've got a question. And that Marilyn said at one point, what even is a social movement? And I was kind of wondering if the panel had some reflections on what is a social movement today and how are they actually mobilising contemporary young activists? And part of, I guess, my go at that is that maybe they don't think about movements anymore, they think about unifying ideas, and I'm thinking of some of the things that we haven't talked about a lot, such as anti-racism, peace movements, um, and there's been a bit of a touch on human rights, so maybe it's these ideas that of the way they want um, society to be. Marriage equality, as Dennis talked about, it was a really important sort of episode but it was within. A yeah. So it was a Sorry, movement. It was I, no, I agree it was a movement, but it doesn't fit neatly into some of the ways we talk about history in terms of the actors and the movements. Of course it was a movement. But that's what I wanted to say. So do we mainly see these movements at, at their intersection with um, electoral politics and formal politics as well? 
<laughs> Look, I think I think I, <laughs> I, 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 I think I think what may have what may have changed is the way in which people are mobilised. Yes. That's changed, and of course, lots of people feel they're in a movement because they tick something on TikTok or WhatsApp or whatever. But I would say there are. Um, I would see something like Get Up as a movement. It organises people. It gets people out handing things out on election day. It does all the sorts of things that I would associate with a social movement. So, as, as you gather, I couldn't restrain myself. Sorry about that. But I think that, um, what, as I say, what has changed is the technology, but not the essence. All, all right. We might um, in the, uh, follow up the definitional uh, conceptual questions afterwards and, and go to the uh, front row here. Yeah. Uh, Leon Nan, Melbourne. Um, Heidi, congratulations. I thought what you had was a terrific case uh, analysis of what is a social movement organisation. Uh, and what I'm heading to is there is a rich uh, sociology, literature on social movement organisation, uh, including such questions as uh, what are the ways in which you mobilise uh, successfully, uh, the discipline of a social movement organisation, its accountabilities, etc., uh, which came through very strongly in the, the land rights uh, movement in New South Wales, but also uh, whether various protest uh, tactics uh, and attempts to try to change by using uh, various uh, methods ranging from vote through to violence, uh, but actually more successfully affecting change by virtue of what's called unruly protest. Bill Gamson wrote about that quite a lot, analysed successful protest movements, and they leaflet, they petition, uh, they march, they do sit-ins, uh, but my question really is for the entire panel. Um, if we look at the effectiveness or, uh, of the various uh, uh, social movements, political movements, uh, can we distinguish between them in terms of whether, uh, not only how difficult is the cause, the, the cause to change minds, but also because some are far more sophisticated and effective in actually getting themselves organised and being able to recruit members and. Uh, accordingly to, uh, to change views and attitudes. Um, yeah, thanks, Leon. I think what's interesting about social movements is how much um, the tried and tested old methods endure. Mm. And they are very, very good at adding new processes like use of social media into their rich repertoire of how they take things up to the polity. But there's nothing like pure old-fashioned disruption um, to push an issue. So, you know, the school kids' strikes and Extinction Rebellion, uh, you know, are much more powerful than, than all the box ticking in online petitions you can ever do. Uh, you know, it's what I said about the importance of a radical flank that moves the spectrum of debate so that the, the political mainstream grabs onto the moderates in a movement and says, oh, well, at least these people aren't completely crazy. Uh, let's give them something. And so you get these reforms. But actually, you reminded me then disruption, the anti-COVID movement in Melbourne uh, in the last election, actually. And that actually didn't seem to happen. I mean, the anti-COVID, the anti-vaccination movement, you know, was, was meant to be centre of this election. And yet it didn't, it wasn't. I mean, so disruption and being radical and mainstream and loonies and fruitcakes, you know, um, it, that didn't necessarily grab the polity at all. But anyway, sorry, I wanted to make a different point um, in response to that, and that is, this is a social sciences symposium, and it's multidisciplinary. And your question, um, you know, made me think about, which we always used to think about a lot in multidisciplinary work, is the way the different disciplines we come from, we're mainly historians here, although Dennis, I guess, calls yourself a political scientist. Not just for today. <laughs> um, and so a sociologist and a political scientist 
and a psychologist, you know, I mean, we should think about the way different disciplinary backgrounds and perspectives shape this as well, given that we're in a social sciences symposium. Uh, Heidi, if she wants to respond to the question, and then I think Frank wants to say something as well, and then unfortunately we might have to close the session. Yeah, yeah. I was just thinking, um, if we think about land rights as a, you know, as a so a movement that achieved um, considerable um, political change, you know, it did actually redistribute by 1983. Um, at least in theory and in sometimes in, in reality, um, significant resources uh, from the public sphere to this really untested Aboriginal sphere, Aboriginal polity land councils. So, um, and it also, for 15 years, there was a funding, um, a, sun, a funding mechanism, a sunset clause that was attached to a certain small percentage of the land tax revenue. And that funding is there now and that's what... Um, funds the land council into the future. But what, um, uh, you know, one of the things is that many, uh, much of the alliances, the sort of leadership that underpin that movement for land rights, for land justice, uh, doesn't operate in the same way. And so uh, the, um, the, the state office of the land council operates in a way that is very arguably very much about compliance um it's doesn't um uh the alliances it doesn't operate in a in a way that appears to look like the sort of alliance building that were, that informed the movement that were the really the underpinnings of the political movement of the or or the movement for land rights um and it's very much a um, arguably a corporatist structure um, that is not at the forefront of um, particular political ambitions, so whether that be um, in, environmental concerns or, or other matters. So in a way, um, that the case study of land rights in New South Wales um, does have an end point um, in the sense that land rights also becomes, um, you know, um, the... It, it becomes um, very much um, corporatized, so it becomes part of a sort of neoliberal project. Thank you, thank you, Heidi. That of course then brings us back to the question raised earlier about the interaction between social movements and the state and the different forms and consequences uh, that that has. I'm grateful, very grateful to all our participants this afternoon uh, for their participation and for such excellent papers. Uh, so please join with me in thanking them. So I understand now we have uh, 10 minutes or so, which is about a review of uh, today and then over to the Cunningham Lecture. Um, is this still working? Thank you. Uh, panelists, we're, we're still going. So, we're, so I've, I've been asked to do a two-minute summary of the day, and I'm sure you'll be delighted to know that you have to sit still for another two minutes. But um, uh, Marion yesterday summed up uh, the first day with the four panels um, uh, on, on the Monday. Uh, my job is to say a little bit about the three panels on the Tuesday um, and then let you go for um, the next activity. Um, it's really just to say um, it's, it's been a, a really stretching, um, uh, challenging set of issues. We've had more than a dozen speakers on quite diverse topics, very different perspectives, uh, covering the range of social science activities. And uh, in some of the panels, we've uh, set ourselves the challenge of thinking outside Australia, looking at um, the international scene. Uh, the first panel this morning, for example, uh, included uh, a, a caustic appreciation of what had been going wrong in the USA, 
um, uh, through uh, James Fifner's uh, presentation, um, which was quite um, ex excoriating, to use an old-fashioned word. And uh, some of the disappointment there was that um, uh, when asked, he had no particular solutions. Um, and uh, uh, the brave attempt to say, well, maybe Australia could teach you a lesson, and the answer was, well, um, in theory that might be true, but in practice it's not going to happen. And so we're all a bit puzzled about where American leadership on uh, democratic uh, governance uh, is going to go and whether that's a, an attractive model for other countries who are thinking about where they want to take their countries. We then had two fascinating accounts of what was going on uh, in terms of the Confucian countries, the background to uh, thinking about um, how, how virtue and knowledge uh, might inform different kinds of political systems and the possibilities for uh, democratic um, uh, currents of thinking to uh, become inserted into those sorts of cultures. And we had quite a debate about uh, how that might work. Uh, I won't try and summarise that, but um, uh, a, a number of you are very interested in how that plays out also in, in foreign policy and international investments, such as the uh, the BRI initiative and whether that's old-fashioned economic imperialism or whether it's something else um, and then how that leads back to issues about uh, how development aid should work and the extent of uh, local involvement uh, in, uh, in development projects, uh, particularly those that go beyond um, big infrastructure. The, the second panel on democracy and constitutional change, again very diverse, very challenging, uh, very stretching. Uh, we talked quite a lot about whether the system still has a capacity for uh, dealing with um, serious uh, le uh, change at, at the level of uh, constitutions and the way we govern ourselves and uh, the kinds of examples we were particularly talking about uh, were the, uh, the First Nations voice uh, but also um, its linkage with uh, big uh, issues around uh, republicanism, uh, the future of constitutional monarchies and so on and so forth. Um, and we're all looking forward to reading Dennis Altman's book about uh, God Save the Queen. Um, the, uh, the issues there were um, included things like uh, arguing for equality is not arguing for sameness, that we have to recognise that um, some interests are special and different and we have to uh, take a more nuanced view of uh, how we deal with uh, equality as a, as a principle in these kinds of issues. Um, the, uh, the process for shaping up the wording of the referendum uh, was very intriguing and uh, some of the presenters said there was still a way to go on that but clearly there are different views about how much detail to uh, divulge, uh, what kind of legitimate process needs to be seen to being undertaken uh, for uh, the referendum to be uh, more successful and so on. And uh, finally, um, the, the great panel we've just had here with, um, with uh, five people involved, um, the, um, uh, the role of social movements and the linkage to democracy, uh, we tended to deal uh, with um, the social movements that had some kind of positive uh, change and some connection to democracy. Uh, we didn't link it back to yesterday's topic about um, uh, extremist populist kinds of social movements, which might also qualify, but the kind of ones we're interested in are the ones that um, uh, are, are progressive and are interested in issues like uh, representation and um, combating oppression and discrimination. Uh, the historical f um, angle here is absolutely vital. Uh, there's some interesting perspectives, I think, about have we moved forward, in fact, over the last 100 years or the last 50 years or the last 10 years? And the answer is quite um, variegated, quite um, uh, nuanced. And uh, we ended up with some discussion about how these issues um, become entangled and perhaps mutually supportive, and um, also their adaptiveness to uh, a circumstance and opportunity, including uh, a couple of final comments about uh, 
uh, capacity for mobilisation and using the most um, uh, recently available forms of communication, uh, which uh, hopefully the younger generation will be able to uh, take forward uh, with great success into the future. Um, I think I've, I've had more than my two minutes. Um, there are lots and lots of points I jotted down that I'll come back to and want to talk to particular individuals about. But uh, overall, I would say um, democracy is a huge topic. Uh, we've only scratched the surface, but we've scratched uh, some really important uh, facets of this debate. Uh, it's been a, a robust and diverse um, conversation, and uh, I'd personally like to uh, thank the Academy and the organising committee for making this possible. Thank you.